changes all around us every day. So how do you manage the changes that happen in mining year round? Welcome to another episode of Change Itself hosted by Gus Miner and Eric Demers. The show is brought to you by Sophie and Technica Mining and is produced by Crownsman Partners. Now, here are your hosts, Eric and Gus. All right. Welcome everyone to episode number 10 for Change Itself. Uh, if, uh, you know, again, thank you for joining in and listening in. And if uh, you don't get the notifications, uh, please go ahead and uh, like us on LinkedIn, uh, Change Itself, or uh, ring the bell and, and subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can also go to changeitself.com to get access to our, uh, to our YouTube channel. Uh, we're here with Eric, and we've got a special guest uh, this afternoon uh, with uh, Dr. Sidney Shapiro, uh, where we're going to be diving into the conversation about how to become a data-driven organization. Um, Eric, uh, since our last episode, um, I mean, it seems like it's been a year uh, or more. It's been quite an intense uh, 30 days, it seems. How, uh, how are things been going for you in your world? Extremely busy. It feels like I've been shoveling a lot. Like it's never stopped snowing. Yeah, especially in the last 24 hours. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's been, uh, you know, it, it looks nice and bright outside now, but uh, it wasn't the picture on the way in this morning. Yeah. No, with uh, you know two school bus cancellations in a row, uh, parents are shuffling and uh, scrambling and finding their way to work and making it all happen. So it's uh, it's uh, it's been a, it's been a fun time, uh, especially you know with the regular winter and winter conditions. And uh, it was funny because you know I said I'm going to get ahead of it and I'm going to get a whole bunch of it cleared up, um, you know, around supper time last night. I said you know that way it'll be a lot less to do in the morning. It was a lot less, but uh, it almost felt like I did nothing at all. So we did get uh, I got, we did get a lot of snow overnight. Well, I forgot the camera and the broadcast, like the the microphone and the stuff to do the podcast this morning at home, and I had to go back. And when I got back, I, I couldn't I couldn't get into the driveway with the truck. Like uh, I had to park on the side of the road, run in, and come back, and uh, I'll have to deal with that one when I get home. But uh, you know, we're talking about three four foot snow bank. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and it. And it when we, when we think about, you know, everything we've been talking about over the past, uh, you know, almost a year now for our episode, our shows. So, you know, we've been, we've been working a lot around data and, and I even made a post about it on, uh, on social media about, Hey, here's a forecast for the next three days. Let's get ready. Everybody. There's going to be a lot of shoveling in our forecast. And it was, it seemed to be well and nice dispersed over three days. And it seemed like we had a good plan. And then as we went through hour by hour, the data was changing on us, right? Uh, so you're trying to make decisions and you're trying to make a, you know, uh, you're trying to make a game plan based on the data that's there. Uh, and then next thing I was like, no, surprise, you're going to get it all in 14 hours. Uh, forget splitting it over three days, right? You're getting it all now and, and deal with it. So whether that was good or, or bad, I mean, it, it just, uh, it was a moving target nonetheless, right? Yeah, I want to go call, uh, camping where our guest is right now. Yeah, right on. So it's a good segue. I mean, we're talking about being data driven. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Shapiro. Uh, officially, congratulations on uh, on your latest designation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Right on. So right. yes, we'll have some great conversations today around. Uh, you know, we we've been having a lot of conversations, Eric and I, um, on the show and aside from the show about, you know, all the moving parts uh, involved in. Uh, converting organizations or, or adapting organizations to um, first about care about data um, and, and help them make decisions accordingly. Uh, and what a great uh, topic for you to cover. Uh, maybe you can cover a little bit of what your specializations are. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can prod you a little bit to see if we can offer some good insights and tools for our viewers to, uh, to take advantage of. So I do a lot of different kinds of data analysis. And basically what it comes down to is figuring out how to make decisions with data. And there's so many different ways you can use it in many different organizations. Um, I focus on programming and data analysis using platforms like Excel and Power BI, Tableau, dashboards, other things like that. But really when it comes down to it, every organization for the past 20 years has been collecting huge amounts of data, huge amounts, but analyzing almost none of it. and the decisions that they're making are usually by gut instinct. And if you've ever seen the movie Moneyball, which is highly controversial in some circles, they people have always been doing baseball a certain way. And then, you know, a new data-driven approach comes along, which flies in the face of everything else and like really breaks it up. And that's transformative change is a huge deal. And that happened in baseball. And that was a real story. But imagine in every other organization, you're making decisions, you're spending money, you're trying to make more money or save money or do things smarter 
with the data that's going through your organization, but maybe you don't capture it. Some businesses have been writing stuff down on paper for the past hundred years. Some businesses have been using Excel. And it's interesting that I meet people in business that have an Excel sheet and they have a hundred thousand lines of data and they're literally putting in piece one after another after another. And they sit the whole day, their job is doing Excel. But with a few formulas, with a few magic pieces, with adding on more and more fancier tools, they can get through that million line job in two seconds and then something happens. I'll give you a great example. I worked with a company a few years ago. This is like a really big company that deals with many, many suppliers and they have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lines of data. And they contacted Amazon has a service that it's called Mechanical Turk and they'll get people to like break down those jobs into little pieces. They'll carry it out over and the Amazon said it would cost a hundred thousand dollars and it would take two years to complete the job by somebody doing it. And my students sat down, they figured it out in 15 minutes and they did two years worth of work in 15 minutes with three lines of code. And the company was blown away is because that kind of experience is completely transformative. You're like the way we've been doing things on Excel doesn't make sense. There has to be other tools out there that will automate this job and make it so much faster. And within the next several years of working with them, they completely changed from Excel where they started out to using totally different tools to analyze their own data, the data that they had anyways, they just never got any insights out of because they weren't able to see the big picture. All they were looking at is the individual trees. You know, I'm sure you got uh, some good questions on that one, huh, Eric? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, living the, I've kind of lived every piece. I'm waiting for that aha moment. Um, yeah, no, like you talked about things on paper for a hundred years. I mean, that's what we've been doing here at Technica and probably in the mining industry is the, especially the field level risk assessments, the five point cards and the pre-offs. We've been doing them on paper forever. And then we went, probably two, three years ago now, we went the digital route with the uh, Sophie and we've got, uh, we're using that and we're collecting that and it's still sitting there relatively unused and untapped. Um, and so whether it's in a spreadsheet or in the database and we're just starting to like really take a look at tools like Power BI to see what we can uh, see. And so I'm definitely interested in hearing more. I mean, we've lived it, I've lived it with timesheets from the the paper-based handwritten timesheets to creating an Excel template and then, you know, putting that into a, a spreadsheet and database, if you will, and then trying to analyze that and we've gone through viewpoint. Like, I mean, we, we've lived it, we continue to live it. And I think we're on the verge of uh, really getting good insights from that data. We're just, that's maybe where I'm really interested in hearing more about this. You know, I think the timesheets is a really good example, and I'm going to go completely against the stuff that I teach, and I'll tell it to you from the other side, the business perspective. You're working on paper, and you're like, okay, I need a better system. We'll switch it to Excel. My question, which is kind of fundamental, is what happens when things go wrong, and guaranteed they will go wrong? Maybe you could figure out Excel, and you have somebody who can do the Excel and you know, like figure out what went wrong, fix the formula, the sheet works again. That's pretty doable for most people who work in business. You're like, okay, so that part works. Let's scale it up to a database. Let's start you know, using high dimensional data. We'll use all these different kinds of fancy tools to make them all work together. Suddenly the fix to your problem when things go you know, catastrophically wrong, which they will, that's guaranteed. That needs to be a more complicated, fancier solution and really needs those pieces to work together. So I think that there's not only an organizational shift that has to happen to support those tools in the future, but also you know, move together and really go through that digital transformation phase. Yes, you've always been doing things on paper. Maybe there's five things in Excel you could learn that bring you to the next level. You've always been using Excel. What are the next few things to help you get closer to Power BI, to work on a data model, to move things a little bit further? So when things do go wrong, it's not a big deal. You could figure out what's going on and, and make it work. And I think that that process is a really big challenge for many organizations because it changes up how they do everything. And when you get to the point where you're able to make better decisions based on data, you're able to pull the data out and figure out what's going on, it really makes a huge difference. I worked with an organization that had five years of data. Before I looked at the, uh, at the organization's data, I said, like, you tell me, what do you think the problems are? We'll see if I can find them. And they're like, we have no idea. And it turned out that based on the appointments that they had for five years, nobody ever came on Friday. And there was twice as many people who came on Mondays. And people were waiting in line on Monday to get helped. Customers were upset. They weren't getting served. But on Fridays, nobody ever showed up. 
And the obvious solution for the organization was, let's close on Fridays. We'll have twice as many staff on Mondays. Everything works out perfectly. And those kinds of insights seem completely obvious. But when you're in it, you really are only looking at the trees and not the forest. It's impossible for you to say, oh, these are the system level changes that we have to make to make sense using the resources we already have. So a lot of times working with organizational capacity, trying to level up the different pieces to meet people where they are at the level of technology where they are and level that up really helps build the capacity to move forward. You know, there are very fancy tools out there. And if you go to a data scientist and they give you a bunch of fancy code, it's useless. Not only is it useless, it has no continuity. You're not gonna be able to take this and put it into action. You're not gonna see actionable insights. You're not even gonna be able to understand your own data. So you really have to work with the tools that you have and then build up that capacity so the pieces that you're building together come into it. And I think, for example, with Sophie, that's a great example of what they're doing, taking the data, combining it with systems that figure things out, and then bringing it to you in a format that you could understand, turning the data into information so it's actionable. And that's really you know, a complicated piece that I think if you remove the complexity from it, people say, oh, that's obvious. It totally works. You know, I've met with people who have said, oh, I want to do machine learning or artificial intelligence. I'm like, okay, great. But what does that mean? Like, what are you actually trying to do? What is the, this, this project supposed to accomplish? Once you figure that part out, it makes everything else a lot easier. And again, maybe it's just analyzing timesheets or finding out how they cluster or finding out where there could be efficiencies, or maybe there's patterns or trends we don't understand. And the only way to figure that out is really taking a step back and looking at the data holistically so we could figure out how the pieces fit together. So if, if I can recap what I got out of that useful piece for me is don't go from the paper base necessarily to the, you know, full out database, tell me where it's wrong, kind of grow with it, learn with it a little bit so that I can understand, you know, if something's not working, why it's not working and what I need to do to improve it and then continually gradually improve. Definitely. From my perspective, it, the conversation always starts with questions. Forget about the database and whatever. What do you want to accomplish? And like, what are you trying to do? What would be more efficient if it was computerized? If it's nothing, then it's just busy work for the people designing databases. And ultimately, your organization's not going to use them because they don't really see any value in it. If there's certain things that really make sense for your business case, and you're saying like, if I had this efficiency, we could do all these other things that then we could start to look at it and figure out like, what are the pieces in the pipeline to get to that point? And that's what really makes it valuable. But systems change or organizational change for the whole organization looks completely different for everybody in the organization from the top down to the bottom everybody in the company is going to be interacting with data in a different way the person who's been taking the paper forms needs to know certain things like how does the website send in the data what does that look like how does the form work what buttons do you have to press from the person at the top that's interested in kpis that's looking at the global perspective of the company and how things are doing and what metrics we're working with they need a different appreciation of what's possible, what kind of dashboards can be produced, how can we take information and use it. And I think everybody in their roles, once they start learning those pieces slowly and you build up capacity, are able to transform everything into doing things in a new way. But it really is like a slow process that has to be planned. So you're able to, you know, embark on digital transformation in a way that makes sense for the organization and does help answer questions. By the time you get there, there'll be brand new questions you didn't even know existed, but it moves it in the right direction. Well, that's what I found myself doing. So I may have jumped into the deep end. We hired a business data analyst and we had no idea what we were doing and kind of growing the role and we're still in the process of. And now he's introduced processes like we've got a, a tracking sheet where we track all the various projects and asks. And we've now developed a, like a project charter, if you will, of, you know, some key questions that are what we're trying to achieve. What I really struggled at first is like, how to formulate a question to get something back that's useful. Cause I was really much like, here's a data set. Tell me, give me something good without knowing what to ask. And I found that to be difficult both, both for the business data analyst and for myself, like I'm expecting something. I don't really don't know what I'm going to get back. And I actually don't know what was possible. So I'm wondering if you have like some ideas and some tips on like how to formulate those questions, what we should be asking, maybe looking for. Um, and from what I'm hearing, it's probably going to start from very simple. And then as we start to learn a little bit more, maybe get a little more complicated. So I'll tell you about tomatoes. That's usually my best example. All right. If you want to ask somebody where the secret army base is, you go up to a bunch of people, you're like, hey, where's the secret army base? And of course, they don't tell you because it's a secret. So you're like, okay, 
I, I can't ask people where the secret army base is, but if I made a chart that shows how many tomatoes are delivered everywhere in the whole country, and I see this one place in the middle of Saskatchewan in a field that's suddenly getting thousands of tomatoes, that's probably where the secret army base is. If you think about that example in your organization, there's probably a lot of administrative data that runs through your system that's not being used to track people or things or money. It's some other piece of paper, a form that people fill out, some kind of metric that exists, but it's not being used in that way. Looking at administrative data first and figuring out what can we, what can we find out using these pieces in our organization, it doesn't require you to gather new information. It doesn't require you to gather new questions. It kind of helps figure out what's already going on. I think the biggest challenge to a business, especially for an analyst coming in, is not understanding the fundamentals of the business to the point where they can make decisions. So I don't know anything about healthcare, for example, but I built healthcare dashboards. But obviously, I'm building them with the metrics of somebody who's a doctor, and they're telling me, these are the things we have to look out for. These are the important numbers. If they go above or below this point, I need a warning about it. And the same thing's true in every business. So if you have an idea about what are the most important metrics to you, and then think a little bit outside of that, what can we figure out using the data we already know? How many times a particular piece of data is used, where it goes, who has access to it, in what way it's driving the organization? Then you could start to ask really interesting questions using the stuff you already have. And then start looking at what else can we go out and grab? What other pieces of information are out there? Oh, that's that actually explains kind of the process we've gone through, which is really good. The one other big learning for me out of all that with the business data analysts is really spending the time, and it, it took a little while to get to understand the various data streams and the databases and the tables in the back end, understand how that, you know, where was that coming from? What did it actually mean? Was it, you know, validated by someone or is it a, just like a piece of, I'll call it raw, raw data for lack of better terms. Like it's a, it's unvalidated, whether it's true or not, don't know if it's garbage or if it's, if it's uh, valuable in any ways, but it was really getting to learn the business and the processes in, in the, that happened on the day to day that fed these systems so we could actually get some insightful data out of it. Having those processes in place before you put data in the system are really important to make sure that you're making insights that are actually accurate because they're based on good data. And that's a whole process in itself. You know, everything we talk about in data science is about ETL, extracting data, transforming it and loading it in a different format, moving it around and making it work in a different way. And we do this in, in so many different ways that we can make decisions based on that. You know, if you think about it, if you use like Instagram or Facebook or one of those sites, really what you're looking at is a connection to a database. And when you scroll down, it says, oh, I'm going to go grab the next picture, go to the database, retrieve it, bring it back. And that process happens in so many different ways inside of our business as well. Like you have a whole bunch of numbers that are coming into a database. They're being put into formats that different users can use in different ways, the transformation piece. And then finally, they're consumed in that loading stage, in a dashboard, in a program, something that helps automate or make decisions. And that really depends on the, on the quality of the data moving through the system as it goes. The other part is, so we do the pipelines and we figure out the data and we know that we're having good quality data moving around the organization. We figure out what data we have access to and what we can use. Then you have the other part. And if you're my age, our age, you'll probably relate to this. You want to rent a movie, you go to Blockbuster or the corner store, and there's a movie. And if, whatever the movies are, you have to pick from one of 10 of them, you pick it up. The problem is that today you go to Netflix and there's 10,000 movies or more. And you have to go through all these different choices to make a decision. And not only that, it's also being like adapted to your taste and the decisions you made before. And you suddenly start watching a bunch of cartoons or your kids are using the, the, uh, the channel. And then suddenly every, chain, uh, every option changes. And that's kind of what happens with the business data as well. Like if you go down a rabbit hole, you're gonna be looking at completely the wrong kind of data and how to use it. So you really have to think about how many choices there are. And once you get all those choices, what does it mean? Like, how can you analyze them in a way using maybe better tools or bigger tools to try to figure out what can we find out now? Before, when I went to the store, I could pick one of 10 movies. It was pretty easy to make a decision, which excluded all the other possibilities. Now I'm in the Netflix mode. I have to figure out, okay, not only do I have Netflix, I also have Amazon. I have all these other, all these other choices too. I got to really focus down on what do I want to watch? Like what genre are we even talking about? Make a decision based on that and then start looking through choices and figuring it out. We go through this process in our brains automatically. When we look at a big business and we're trying to figure out how many complicated pieces of data are there and how could they talk to each other and use them together, it creates a huge challenge. And that's really what a lot of data engineering is about, setting up the pipeline so the right data is going into the problem and then ultimately being transformed into something that's a solution on the other end. 
We have fancy tools to do that, but it doesn't replace the domain knowledge, the business knowledge that you need to answer if this even makes sense. Otherwise, you could do the process, but if it doesn't make sense, the answers aren't going to be good. Every worker deserves to go home safely at the end of the day. Book a demo with Sophie to discover how their groundbreaking EHS management software empowers workers to proactively avoid hazards and how organizations like yours can cultivate a stronger work culture. Visit them at sophie.com to learn more. Technica Mining is a premier underground mining and construction contractor. They stand for delivering quality project work on time and on budget through innovative thinking. Their excellent safety record, experienced workforce, and large equipment fleet will guarantee the timely completion of all your project needs. Trusted by the world's leading mining companies, Technica Mining has over 20 years of experience in mine construction, development, and production. Contact Technica Mining to take your next mining project to the next level. Visit them at technicamining.com. Change Itself is produced by Crownsman, the voice of industry. Check out more, including the Crownsman Show, Mining Now, Crownsman Energy, and Crownsman Egg at crownsman.com. It's so funny that you brought up the Netflix, <laughs> the Netflix example because, I mean, we were going through that for many, many months, uh, my wife and I. We would sit down, and the length of time we would have had to watch a movie, we were selecting a movie. So we're like, <laughs> I'm like, just pick something. So now we've got, we've graduated ourselves to the place of what do we want to feel today? Do we want to, you know, have a, a, a romantic movie? Do we want to have a happy laughing movie? Do we want to have a controversial movie? Do we want to have, you know, so basically based on the category we pick, then we go straight to what are our, our 10 choices for that category. So it's pretty funny how um, even just looking at our home lives how we're actually deciding how to entertain ourselves or how to do things differently based on now this massive ocean of, of data that's being thrown at us. Right. And, and it, I never really thought about it in that sense until you, you brought it up. So that's a, that's a pretty cool example. So like one of the questions that I had for you uh, for today as well was something that, that is becoming increasingly challenging right? As we're converting to data. So a lot of organizations are making the right, you know, they are making the steps, whether right or wrong, they are making the steps to starting to digitize their day. They're trying to understand a little bit more what's going on the data. Uh, but it's very, very difficult to get um, every tier or every layer of the organization to care about the data collection process or the data in its own. So one, one tier will care a lot about the collection process because they're the ones responsible to give it to you um, or to collect it. So that, that's, that hits them near and dear. But then you also get the top tiers where all they want is the fancy analytics at the end so that you can make a decision and move on. So, you know, we have those conversations a lot where these are the different steps that all of these different departments or all these different layers are, need to take, you know, to take in order to get to the point where we have nice, clean, mature data so that we can eventually get you the dashboarding and a decision-making process that the next tier is looking for. Um, how do you take that, that, that conversation on when the company is, is starting the process and, you know, you've got, you know, maybe, a, maybe you've got an entrepreneur that's been around for 30, 40 years and, and always relied on, on, on his or her gut. And then now they're saying like, oh, hold on, you want me to, to enable this budget or you want me to enable all these activities that are happening all over the place? Um, they care about the dashboard they need, but they're not as 100% connect with all of the parts that need to be in place to get them the answers they want. How do you approach those conversations to get you to kind of get on board uh, on what's required? I think the first place is an acknowledgement that change is really hard and it impacts everybody in the organization differently. You have to learn new things, learn new ways of doing things. And maybe after a very long time, you're doing things slightly differently. But integrating some of these tools in your process or learning some new ways to do things, be really transformative. So to the entrepreneur who's always been doing things a certain way, I met with somebody recently, their job, what they do as the person running their company is spreadsheets. They spend eight hours a day, not running their business, but doing spreadsheets. And I said, here's some formulas, here's some buttons, here's some different ways we can look at things. It's gonna transform what you do because now you have four extra hours a day to grow the business, to look at new opportunities, to do things slightly differently using the same technology, the tools that you're already using, just in a slightly different way. And that kind of incremental change not only starts with each person who's involved, but ultimately brings the entire organization forward. You know, there's organizations that they see, where we worked with a, a, a huge multinational company that is 100% in the Excel world, they're not going anywhere. But interestingly, none of the people who work for them ever use macros. 
And it turns out that the job that they needed to do, which had to be automated in Excel by building some macros, pressing some buttons, radically transform what they're able to do. And with all that freed up capacity, they could start expanding into many new areas. So I think it's really about trying to meet people where they are, understanding what their business case is and what they're trying to accomplish. And then slowly introducing tools that bring them there, not just at one level or another, but maybe a little bit of basic Excel training for everybody, a little bit of basic understanding about a database or statistics in friendly open language helps everybody get onto the same page. And it really doesn't have to be difficult or scary. It can be done in a way that makes everybody's life easier. The person at the front desk who's doing the stuff on paper for the past 30 years, there's things that bother them. They have a pain point that can be addressed through digitization. So maybe instead of having to constantly file things, you press a button, it does it automatically. And that's the hook that brings that person in to get on board with the system. Sure, the person at the other end of the company, they're interested in KPIs and dashboards, but they also care about data quality. They also wanna make sure that the decisions that they're making based on that dashboard make sense and that they're not making decisions based on faulty data. So I think that it looks different for everybody, but acknowledging that and getting everybody on the same page to move forward, even if it's small incremental steps, ultimately has a huge impact on the decisions you're able to make. Gus, one of the things we're trying and we're kind of living through now and on our journey is, I mean, you know, like living it today, um, is I try to avoid, or we try to avoid, uh, creating more forms or adding more steps to the end user because there's an impact there. We're trying to really leverage things that are already being collected and in some way like a tomato. Um, I like that one. Um, anyway, so we're looking at that. The other piece that I'm trying, I'm working with the, the business data analyst on is really looking at where, where were people, where am I asking people to spend a lot of time processing, analyzing, looking at data that could be automated and they could better use the time that they're doing that instead of processing and trying to analyze it and actually go get in action with some of the, the answers, which has actually been an interesting insight and way to look at it for me was that, you know, I was hoping that getting people into the data would really get them to see issues and then go do something about it. But what I found is you get into the data and you're trying to process and analyze, you have to relearn that every month and then you run out of time and steam and you might not take action because you're just busy trying to check the box as opposed to like gaining insights. Uh, that's been my experience in the last, I'll call it two, three months. So thought I'd share that. Yeah, no, it's great insight. And you know, at the same time, it by having, you know, by both of your points, by, by having those small incremental uh, process adaptations, we won't call them changes because that's a scary thing, right? Well, but if we go at adaptations, then it, I think for the most part, the majority of the fear about feeding a black box that's giving you data that's unvalidated can kind of start dissipating, right? Because they know what they've put in, they know what they're extracting out, and they've kind of done that you know, validation on their own at a very, you know, molecular kind of scale. So then they know that, hey, when all these things combined together come out, I can actually trust the output because I understand all the little pieces that are that are being uh, absorbed. So, you know, all the tomatoes make a basket and then you can trust that they're all good tomatoes because of the process. So it's, uh, no, it's, it's, it's just really interesting, right? Because we do have those conversations with many organizations that were, where they're transitioning flat out from paper into uh, digitization. And a lot of times the conversation goes, I want you to give me uh, analytics from my paper, right? Well, and then we talk about, let's start, you know, getting some quick wins about transitioning some of these things into a digital format, which later we can start, you know, diving into the data and get you some ana analysis. Uh, but, but, you know, let's start by collecting, doing some interim analysis, collecting some more at a more extensive level, more interim analysis, and then, and then go on from there. So I guess, you know, one of the things that I wanted to touch on uh, with you today is like, if you had to give somebody, you know, like a very high level plan, as far as, okay, you're going straight from paper or straight from, you know, maybe even just, you know, Excel with no tools attached, just flat out Excel. Um, and then you got files all over in fol folder systems. Um, if you had to do like a one, two, three, four, five approach, as far as like, you know, explaining how you're going to get to deep analysis, uh, to get some really good wins from the large scale data, what, what, what does that ladder look like in your, in your point of view, uh, Sydney? 
Well, let's let's start with Eric. Eric, what do you like on a pizza? What do I like on a pizza? Lots of cheese. Perfect. Look at this. Eric took every possibility in the entire world, every possibility, and boiled it down to one choice, lots of cheese. You know, and that's like the go-to option. That's the thing that he's been doing all the time. Maybe I could interest him in a slightly different variation of that, right? Maybe like I could tempt him with an extra cheese plus, you know, pepperoni pizza, maybe something like that, like, you know, and again, there's billions of possibilities of what you could do. In the end, there's like unlimited ways that we could analyze our data and we make these decisions instantly, but computers really have to go through like huge amounts of choices to make the ones that are actually gonna work. And we have to come up with a pathway to work. And I want you to think about it. You go to a pizza store, you could order any size pizza with any size toppings, potentially millions of combinations. You make a decision in one second. So that's really the first place to see where you are. What kind of pizza do you want? Maybe there's small increments of how we could change it up. We'll add some basil to this pizza. We'll see what happens. We'll try some small variation to see if there's something that we could, you know, maybe do a little bit different, a little more efficient and so on. As far as the data goes, I think that the first place, you know, the deep insights really comes down when you have a seven topping pizza and it's just perfect and everything works together. To get to that point, you need some work though. The first place is really to assess where you are and to look at what are the strengths, what are you trying to accomplish and really using your domain knowledge of the business, what makes sense? Like what are the most important things you have to know? Once you know that, it comes down to organizing the files, organizing the data, making everything work together and talk to each other. I think the number one problem I see often, especially in small businesses is backing up your data, having it talk to each other in a way that makes sense and you don't accidentally lose everything. That's a big problem. And then looking at, okay, so from where we are right now, there's some kind of incremental change we could look at, like adding some formulas, adding a button, making a macro, customizing things to make it easier. A lot of it has to do with the repetitive jobs that we do every day, adding numbers together, changing things, looking at ratios. Once we get a good idea of what you're trying to accomplish and what's really important to help you make decisions, we can start moving to the next step. Let's automate all of that. Press a button and we'll take this entire column and turn it into a chart. And we could do that over and over again. If you think about it, you know, when you have a credit card company and they send out bills to thousands of customers, somebody presses one button and it takes everybody's name, the amount that they owe, all their charges, puts it together into a form, mails it to the customer, and it does that in batches over and over again, thousands and thousands of times. So the guy who pressed the button, that's, and all the data is okay, they checked everything, it's okay, you press the button and start the process. And we really want to work towards that point of putting things into a process that we're able to automate more and more. We don't have to spend time with every single bill, every single person. It just happens automatically. It happens as part of a process. Then once we get to that, great, that's one process. What are other processes that we can layer into the, into the company, into the way that we treat data to maybe make even better decisions? Like for example, we can do an analysis. Once we have all the right pieces, are our customers paying by credit card or debit card or by cash? How much money does each one of those options cost us? Is the interchange fee we pay with credit cards, does it make sense? If we got rid of credit cards, would we lose sales? And those are scenarios that we could start to game out and look at once the data's in there in a way that we can understand. And you can do that in Excel with pivot tables. If you wanna get even fancier, we could start using fancy programs like Solver and figuring out how much should we charge for different items? What should the mix of products and prices be? We can go from there. And then we could say, okay, we can make all these decisions, but Again, the CEO is not a data scientist. They need to have the data in a format they can understand. Let's use Power BI, let's use Dashboard. Let's make it into a way that you press a button, you get actionable insights and answers, and we could start making decisions based on the best available data. And that really helps us move things forward because whether your gut tells you that it's right or wrong, it's a good idea to know what the numbers are saying before you make a decision to have the extra input. Nobody's ever said they don't wanna make a decision based on the input. They may not agree with it and do something else and that's okay. It's really important to know what's out there, what information is available. And for the most part, you're collecting the data anyways. You might as well use it in a format that makes sense. So, I mean, uh, you know, for, for, for the sake of time in our audience, I know that for us, we can go on uh, for a long time on this topic because uh, we do have projects that we are going on <laughs> for a long time on this topic. Uh, but, you know, we always try to wrap things up with something that's, you know, either technology basis or something that's, you know, uh, really shown or proven uh, great dividends um, with what's going on today. Uh, is there anything that kind of came across uh, your peripheral vision or through your, through your hands uh, in the past year or so that you said, you know what, this is actually a tool 
um, or, a, or a system or, or a process that's really transformative and, uh, you know, that we'd, uh, we can mention today and discuss a little bit about? So I think there's a lot of different tools. There's a lot of different things that are out there. I think one that people don't really understand, but that's really, really important is something called machine learning. It does a bunch of different things, but basically it's training a computer to recognize patterns or to put people in different clusters. And that sounds complicated, but really, if I take a whole bunch of people and I know a bunch of things about them, I could find out how do they cluster? For example, different people own different lawnmowers. What does that mean? Does it relate to the kind of house they have, how much income they have, what kind of products I could sell them, advertising campaigns, and so on. Every business is gonna be different, but sometimes I have a lot of data and I'm looking for outliers or exceptions. I'm looking for things that are completely different. But maybe if I cluster data in different ways, I could find out, wait, there's actually three groups here. And each group has different requirements, different preferences. And maybe I could devise or change what I'm doing for marketing, for sales, for you know, internal satisfaction or other things to respond differently to different groups. Quite often, just the way that we process, we can't see that the groups even exist. We don't know that people are buying in different patterns. We don't know that our customers are of different types. We don't know that our clients are clustering in different ways. Again, an obvious example would be people who are using cash versus credit card versus debit. Once we start working on that clustering using different technologies like machine learning or artificial intelligence, we could see a whole bunch of insights that we could respond to in a data-driven way. And we can make decisions that we didn't even know existed before in our clientele. How nice would it be if your company that you're spending money with really understood you? And they're able to offer you services that you actually care about, not random spam mail, but things that respond to you or you're able to find solutions to business that really matters, business problems that are going on, but you're just not able to see it in the giant sea of data. So I think that that kind of technology using clustering, using machine learning can really be beneficial. A lot of people think it's magic because it does a lot of things like AI robots, but really on a simple level, it's how do we group data together to give us new insights that we didn't know about before? No, no, that's that, that's that's some great insight. And as you were explaining the machine learning process and the clustering, uh, I've been recently challenged with you know a problem that we've been having on our side, and I kind of had to do it the manual way. But I was like, man, it'd be it would have been awesome if I would have been able to categorize tickets in a certain fashion, um, and then start collecting the time of occurrences and the descriptions, and then it would have probably immediately shown me uh, what I found out through, uh, through manual analysis uh, in seconds, which what, you know, instead of taking me four or five months to figure it out uh, manually. So I think you're, you're onto something there with machine learning for sure. Well, the biggest challenge in every business is churn. Why are some of our customers leaving? What caused them to leave? And what's the difference between the ones that are leave or renew their subscriptions or come back or buy again? What's the difference? For many businesses, people just say, it's the giant hand in the sky makes it happen. Customers show up or they don't show up. I don't know. But maybe there's a reason. Maybe every customer that comes back bought a certain product or somebody said something to them or they had a great experience or something else, right? And by trying to look at the data in different ways, we could see new insights. Like we should be doing more of that. That's gonna drive our business. So clustering I think is huge. And it's, it, it, it can be very simple to do and really explain why are customers leaving? Why are new ones joining? Why are they coming back? What do we do next? Uh, as you say that the uh, things are going off and there's like, I got a million ideas. I never looked at it from a clustering perspective. I always thought you teach something and it's going to look and flag for whatever, right? That was my perspective on machine learning, right? And you start to build the database and teach it and the real basics of it. But thinking about it from a clustering piece and from like a customer standpoint, talk about churn, I'm right away drawn to like employee turnover. What makes an employee want to stay versus an employee that goes? Oh, we often will say it's always money or whatever. And oftentimes it might be, oftentimes it might not. And so it's, it's, it would be interesting to understand what that was. To your point, was it something somebody said? Did we promise something along the way? Did we do an employee review? Did we not do a review? Right. Those would be really interesting things to like just go look at just off of that. Is it related to the number of trainings? Are we over training? Are we under training? Like all that stuff just really starts to, you know, open my eyes to so many other possibilities. I think the employee turnover is a fantastic example. That's called supervised learning. We already have labels and we know who stayed and who left. And we know a lot about each person. So we know how many trainings they did. We know how much they're getting paid. We know what their interests are. And we have a lot of metrics we could assign to each person. 
What the clustering part of machine learning does is it says, okay, what's the difference between these two? Is there a difference? If we look at the hundreds of data points we have for each person and come up with correlations, which ones are associated with each other, then the real challenge becomes the next employee. Could I take this new employee who I don't know anything about, put them into the system and say, can you predict which box they're gonna end up in based on trainings, based on compensation, based on time, based on activities, and then the computer comes up with a prediction. And that's huge because we could use that in so many different ways to help us guide future decisions once we have a solid model that tells us what happened in the past. There's also unsupervised learning that we just throw stuff in and it tries to find patterns that works too. But either way, we could leverage the data that we have in new ways to help us make decisions. And that's really powerful. It is. Uh, that's uh, quite insightful. So Sydney, I mean, we've, uh, or Dr. Shapiro, uh, we've, we've touched on a lot of things and I think we've given them a lot of people of insights, a lot of insights as well as like how they can approach the transitions to be, uh, you know, a more data-driven organization and, and the tools that we, that we mentioned. Um, if anybody had any questions, how do they get a hold of you? I'm the coordinator of business analytics at Cambrian. I highly recommend find me on LinkedIn. You could add me, send me an email. I'm happy to work with you. And uh, we run a capstone project several times a year. It's a fantastic way to work with students and help figure things out in your business. Right on. That's great. We'll make sure to put your, uh, we'll, we'll put your LinkedIn uh, profile in the uh, description below. And uh, yeah, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of inquiries as far as, uh, you know, how, how you might be able to help out or even how do the students at Cambrian can help, uh, you know, transform uh, somebody's business uh, very quickly uh, by just kind of digging in and asking the right questions. Right on. So here we are closing off our 10th episode. We're into the double digits. Pretty exciting times. Uh, Eric, thanks again for joining in as always. And uh, special thanks for uh, Dr. Shapiro for joining us today. Thank you very and, uh, much. It's thank a you. very insightful. Really appreciate it. I can't believe we're at episode 10. Episode 10 into the double digits. There's no turning back now. So right thanks on. a lot, everybody, for tuning in and uh and and following us and 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 uh and, and you know trying to gather as many insights as we have through the shows. They've been they've been a, as much of a learning experience for us as it has been for hopefully everybody else. And uh Please leave your comments and uh, and uh, questions and uh, concerns uh, in the comments below, and we'll we'll see you for uh, next month for episode eleven.